everyone. Thank you for joining our webinar. This is Jill Hurston. So with that, I'd like to turn this over to our moderator, uh, Rohit Sinha. He is our Director of Product Development with CenterZip. Rohit, I'm going to turn this over to you. All right. Thanks, Jill. And welcome, everyone, to today's webinar, Fixing Broken Teams. So we have deadlines to meet, and high-performing teams are critical to success. When we are not getting the desired quality or needed, th needed throughput, what should we do? So who better to talk about this than Mike Watson? Mike is a VP of engineering at Synerzip. I've been working with Mike for many years and find his perspective on building high, highly efficient teams is spot on. Mike, over to you. Hey, thanks, Rohit. Uh, welcome everyone to uh, the Fixing Broken Team topic. Uh, this is something that I launched back in November at Dev Week Austin. Uh, I, I did sort of a trial run uh, wasn't a real uh, deep presentation. It was a 20-minute talk, and it seemed to resonate with folks. I had a lot of traction afterwards. Uh, Rohit, you were there. You were doing speaking as well. Uh, yeah. Your topic was quite good, good as well. Uh, so let me give you a little bit of detail about me. So my background is in development. I've done a lot of work around integration uh, platforms, what we now call service meshes and also a lot with workflow and business applications in general, a lot of B2B work, some B2B to C. Um, and my career in development started, you know, over 20 years ago and Agile was just a fresh new thing and most people didn't know much about it. Uh, so there were a lot, of, a lot of problems that kind of have been sorted since, but a lot of these issues that we're gonna talk about today are still relevant. Uh, after uh, my stint as development and doing development and architecture, I moved into engineering leadership and I've done engineering leadership for uh, over 15 years at this point. Uh, and it's something that I really enjoy. I enjoy coaching and mentoring teams, but I also uh, really enjoy software process and how to build software in an effective manner. So let's move on into the topic. So first off, it's important that we define what a broken team is. So uh, from my perspective, broken really is more like uh, if you think of a military unit where they're overrun by the enemy, their, their morale is broken. So really, it's not so much that the team is a bad team or uh, the people are bad or there's uh, anything wrong at a person level, but maybe the process is off. Maybe it's a startup that gained a bunch of customers and they're still using startup uh, type of uh, processes where you need a more rigorous set of processes. And a lot of times people just get overwhelmed. Um, so the symptoms here are, is erratic delivery, uh, inadequate throughput, and like I say, these morale issues. So if you are like me and you get hired into a team like this to, to lead it out of, uh, you know, lead it forward from this position, you see these same signs. Uh, this is very common. Uh, if you dig a little deeper, you'll see that there's uh, accountability issues on, you know, on various sides within the team, outside of the team, and there's low trust all around. Uh, development team, uh, the product development team, they don't trust the product management team or executive management and vice versa. So this is a pretty bad situation to be in. So I want to do a quick poll of uh, who's experienced the same thing and, you know, maybe what they feel were the causes for that. I'm hoping everybody can see the poll. It looks like you can, because people are voting. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and close it. Yeah, oddly I can't, which is interesting. Um, okay, does everyone have a chance to vote? Mike, can you see the results? I don't see them. Okay, um, well, we do have the results. I'm showing them now. And about 67% of our audience have misalignment of business and technical goals. 33% of the audience has weak product, product management and 0% on the other three on the insufficient okay. technical leadership other, or I've never experienced a broken team, which, wow, that's pretty amazing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. So that falls exactly in line with what I'd expect. Um, generally there's a huge disconnect between, uh, what management team and we'll talk, say executive or upper management, wants and what's actually possible given budgets and uh, you know organization uh, so I, i'm not surprised that 
the 67% number. So let's move on to the next. So one of the first things that I always notice when I go into a situation with a broken team is there's a lot of denial. Uh, they, people think that, you know, we've done it this way for a long time and it's been working and I don't understand why it doesn't work now. It must be, you know, somebody is doing something wrong on another team, right? Like it's very common to blame another team. Uh, but when you, when you, I look into it, I, I see that corners are being cut. Like maybe you're skipping retrospectives or maybe you're skipping, uh, you know, some of regression or maybe you're not doing proper unit testing. I mean, there's all sorts of things that are easily skipped and, uh, at some point in an organizational development, that sh that might be acceptable. Uh, ultimately, done has to mean done. Uh, that's that's where I see the biggest problem is you end a sprint or you end a release cycle, and there's still a bunch of bugs that haven't been dealt with, or there's some features that weren't fully developed, like there were some complications, and then there was a need to cut, and uh, you know, essentially making those features less useful or even unuseful. Uh, so that this done must be done is really important. And I know in modern agile, uh, in the modern, modern agile thinking, the definition of done has become quite, you know, an important topic. And I, I strongly believe that a good definition of done is really important. Um, and then I ha have this question of what, can a waterfall be better than agile? And I'll, and I will say absolutely yes, when the waterfall actually delivers on time with high quality, right? So uh, that's what's important, right? It's delivering customer value on time with a high quality so that the customers are satisfied by it. Uh, so any process that does that is actually acceptable. Now, obviously waterfalls tend to take longer and there, you know, there's a lot of challenges that might be more expensive, but, uh, but you really do need to make sure you're not just focusing on how you do it, but what you're producing at the end. It's gotta have high value. Uh, moving on from there. So one of the things that's really common I see, especially with managers reporting to me, is there's always this call for if I just had a few more people, then I could get through this problem. And yes, that may be the easy route, but it might just be and usually is just a band-aid. So uh, yes, you can throw more people at it, but that certainly doesn't give you the budget. Uh, you know, that's adding cost to the structure and you're not fixing any systemic problems. So uh, I don't like to use that as a, a resort, you know, first resort. Uh, I like to look to other directions. Uh, methodology change is also risky. Like let's say you're using some homegrown process. It's not quite agile, like not quite scrum. You know, it's very common for someone new on the team or someone on the team say, hey, we should use scrum. We should just switch. Well, the problem is if the team isn't trained in how to do scrum, for instance, then it's going to be very difficult to switch. And that's actually going to add even more risk um, in an already tenuous situation. So I, I tend not to try to change the methodology as a first, uh, you know, a first change. Uh, I look, I look elsewhere. And then finally, people can be so frustrated. They just want to reset. Like, let's stop the presses. Let's get ourselves back in order. Let's skip a few sprints and, you know, get tooling in place or do whatever, and then start the presses again. That's very tempting. I've wanted to do that myself as a developer, but the problem is the business really can't afford to stop. I mean, there's bugs that will need to be fixed. There's small features that need to be built for the customers to stay happy. And uh, this this reset just could really, really go wrong. So uh, again, try to avoid that. And as I say here, the flow of business value must continue. So what approach do I take? Uh, so it's a, it's a three-step process for me. So the first step, and this is all about culture change, by the way. The first step is learn how to execute. So what this means is figure out how the team can actually deliver on time. Because there, the low trust comes from the inability to deliver successfully. So product management, upper management, they don't trust the development team because they say they're going to deliver something, and then they're you know two weeks late, six weeks late more late and all the business plans that were made around those delivery schedules go out the window and it's really difficult. Customers are unhappy. You know, it's a difficult story to sell. So the first step, learn to execute. So the team doesn't have confidence 
they need to gain confidence in their ability to do something in the agreed upon time frame. Once you've done, once you've learned to execute, once you start delivering on time, and, and honestly, like the first delivery might be a little bit late, but if you have good transparency on that lateness, that's totally fine. Uh, it's not about delivering exactly on a day, but like really close to the day and, and being able to communicate ahead of time. So once you've established this culture of now we, we know that we can deliver on time, and if we can't deliver on time, we're really good about telling people up front about it. Then we go to a quality focus, because typically what I find in all these situations is that poor quality is actually what's causing most of the low throughput. Uh, so if you can go in and attack quality as a mindset uh, by making quality important to the team and everyone involved in it, then you can start eliminating uh, this waste. Then finally, once, once you've kind of got quality under control and you're delivering decent quality software, look for other areas to improve. Uh, for example, CI CD is a good place. Uh, there's, there's plenty of places. Um, the team generally will help you figure that out, but um, getting this continuous improvement mentality is the ultimate end goal. So learn to execute, establish that quality focus, and then instill a quality, uh, sorry, a continuous improvement mindset. As I mentioned, this is all about culture change. And so it's important as a leader in this case to, to really nurture that change, right? So you do that by listening. Uh, the first thing to do is listen to everyone's ideas. You might know the right thing to do, but you don't ever want to come across as the person who just telling everyone what to do. Uh, listen to the problems, suggest things that lead you towards the answers you know are the right answers, but don't but don't have a draconian approach. Set direction is really important. Most people are looking for direction and they need to understand where they're going. The one, two, three is kind of the direction. And so you can, you can sort of clarify the approach and how you're gonna go through and how it's gonna help you. And that's, you know, this presentation is really all about that. And then finally, you have to demonstrate the values via your actions. If you're saying quality is important, you can't, Tell people that having bugs is okay. You can't ignore bug fixing and you know some of the, th the issues there. You can't let people off the hook on doing unit tests or whatever else you come up with that is important in the quality cycle. So it's important as a leader that you value value that uh, culture change so that everyone else will value it as well. So after that background, uh, we can move into sort of the how. <laughs> so now we know that we have a broken team and we sort of understand the landscape and we kind of have a framework for how we want to move forward. The first step is really to sell this uh, culture transition to your uh, peers and to your management team. The first step that always works for me, and I think it's critical, is that you have to lower the expectations of what can be done in the short term. Uh, typically what I'll say is, uh, you know, I'm going to do 60% less for two releases, but then after that, you're going to get 120% of what you're currently getting or more because we're going to learn how to execute and then we're going to start removing quality. And then all of a sudden you're going to start, uh, quality concerns. And all of a sudden you're going to start moving forward, uh, with more features and it'll just sort of be not magic, but, uh, next thing you know, you'll be getting a lot more. And so you have to really sell that story and it's difficult because you know, again, there's low trust. You're probably coming in new to the organization. So nobody knows what your capabilities are. And so uh, there's a couple of trade-offs you make. So one is this firm commit. So I, when you say that I'm going to do 60%, you say, I'm absolutely going to do that 60% and it's going to be on time. Um, you know, I'm, staking, I'm putting my reputation on the line for that. And then the other thing is I'm going to, I'm going to tell them I'm going to be very transparent. So I'm going to create a reporting mechanism where I can on a weekly basis say that we're red, yellow, green, here are the issues, here are how we're mitigating those issues so that there's no doubt about where we're at in the process. If we're behind, I'm going to tell people we're behind. If we're doing well, I'm going to tell people we're doing well. There's going to be no hiding and there's no secrets. And with this, you can typically win the day. It may take you some time, 
but it's definitely, you know, the first step here. Once, once you've sort of won the day with the, with the management team and your peers, then it's about uh, selling to the team. So you need to set expectations with them. You need to tell them this is what we're agreed to. I've bought you some time. You know, I've reduced you know our expectations, but now we have to deliver on time, and we have to be prepared to work hard. If if something comes up, you know, as it normally does in software, we have to be willing to just overcome it. Work weekends, nights, whatever, just so so we can meet our commitment, because that's what's going to buy us the time to do all the rest of the steps. So with that, I've been talking for a while. Any questions coming up, Rohit? Yeah, hey Mike. So yeah, so there is one question at this point. Uh, so and it, and it is if there is a bottleneck in that team, like missing timelines, incomplete user stories, what can a manager or leader do? Yeah. So what you're saying is um, how how does the leader participate in this? Um, you know maybe pre be prepared to work hard statement. So the leader, you know, a manager uh, or a leader in this case, their job is really un to unblock the team, to find out what's causing problems, what's preventing them from getting being successful and then helping them overcome those. Uh, that could be many different things. Uh, you mentioned a couple uh, requirements could be poor uh, or unclear, or you may not have a commitment from the product management team to you know, show up to demos and provide feedback. Uh, there's all sorts of uh, misalignments that could happen here. So one of the things that you have to do as a leader is you have to go to those other teams and say, hey, in order for us to be successful, you have, there's things we re that are required from you. Like maybe it's a external defect and you need help from the support team to understand it better. Uh, go to their respective managers and leaders and, you know, really sell that this only works if we all work together. Right. Yeah, that makes sense. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, that's the only question at this point of time. Yes. All right. Thanks for it. Um, so let's talk about execution. So I read a book. It was um, part of the GE series. It's called Execution. I think the author is Ram Charon. And what they talk about in execution is that in the GE way, what execution really means. And it's really how how you build something successfully and reliably over and over again. And that's really what I mean by execution. So the definition in the in the dictionary is taking an idea and making it happen. And yes, that's that is what execution means technically, but really what I'm talking about is this on-time delivery concept. So we're going to do what we said we're going to do. And we're going to do it, you know, without you know, skipping anything or uh, you know, there's not going to be a feature loss we're going to do what we said we're going to do. And I think establishing this execution culture is really critical. If if folks don't believe that they have to do what, you know, we said we're going to do, then none of the rest of this matters. And what makes execution possible and I, I left this quote from a, a great colleague of mine, Kishore Dugante, um, building software successfully is all about it's all about um, confidence. And this is so true. Uh, I had led several teams through these transitions before I met Kishore and him and I were just talking about it one day and we were having trouble with the team that we were working on together. And he's like, it's all about confidence. We have to get the team believing in themselves, right? And so that's what I'm trying to do with this execution uh, mentality is we can do this. We, we've done our estimates, we've thought about the problem, and we have the technical capability to make this happen. And making sure everyone really believes that, that it, the power of success is in our own hands. Uh, there's a lot to that. So one of my pet peeves when I go into an organization, whether it's you know one that is running well, or even uh, you know in the case here where it's not running well, it's broken, is housekeeping of, of the tickets. And so I have this quote here, the ticketing system has to be the source of truth. Uh, it's, it's absolutely true. Like your metrics mean nothing if your tickets aren't up to date. And I can't stress that enough. 
So the one of the first things I attack from a management level is let's make sure that we know how tickets need to be updated and make sure that they're all being updated on a reliable basis. And when I say tickets, I, I mean, you know, the whole gamut of tickets. So this could be stories, this could be uh, tickets coming from uh, customers like support tickets, and it uh, also can be defect tickets. If we don't keep them up to date and we don't understand why they're there and how they're moving through the system, we can't go back and sample the data and figure out, you know, where we're having problems, like where are we getting bottlenecked or what types of defects are, are coming up that are, that are causing us issues. You know, are they mostly front end? Are they mostly back end? Are they data issues? Uh, without having tickets that, uh, that describe the problem, then it's very difficult to to get there with the problem. Uh, so the last thing here is if you don't report on the tickets, uh, then then people don't generally care, right? So you have to actually demonstrate that it matters. This goes back to my point about uh, walking the walk. Report on the ticket. Show everyone where you're at. Um, I usually use bug projections uh, as part of my planning. You know, show where we are, you know, plan versus actual. You know, how many bugs have we found versus what we expected to find and how many bugs have we closed versus uh, we expected to close at this point. Uh, and keep this in, you know, keep this in front of everyone so that they know that that these updates do matter and that we're reporting on it and we're even showing it out, out to our peers and to our uh, management team. So the next topic is waste. Hey, Mike, would you uh, like to do a poll real quick on that housekeeping? Oh yeah, that's a good idea, Jill. Um, let's pull up that poll. Okay. Figure out a way to see it. So we have how disciplined is your team regarding updating tickets? If you select one of the following, it's always up to date, mostly good, some gaps. We update all of them at the end or not updated reliably. If everyone could just give you a quick vote. Excellent. And then I'm closing the poll. And Mike, to share the results, since you can't see them, we have always up to date, 0%. No big surprise there. Mostly <laughs> good, some gaps, is 75%. We update them all at the end is 0%, and not updated reliably is 25%. Okay. So, again, that's probably what I would expect. Most modern uh, agile methodologies require you know good ticket updating this is something like i say in the older days was not something that was as critical but uh, you know since everyone is doing daily stand-ups and paying attention to the tickets in more detail uh, i would expect uh, a lot better and reliable updates of tickets i've definitely dealt with teams that you know they came in and they would update them all at the end because uh, they needed to like show what was done in a particular release uh, that's where that particular option came in. Um, I, I just don't think people think that way anymore, which is great. Uh, it certainly helps us as leaders move the team in a better better direction. All right, so let's talk about waste. And I didn't mean for that slide to have transitions like that. So ultimately how you're gonna gain throughput is by eliminating waste. And waste comes in a lot of factors, but one of the biggest wastes outside of just building the wrong thing, which is out of scope for this conversation, is uh, defects and letting defects creep through the system. And we've all seen the statistics where the longer you let a defect go through the system, the more expensive it is, where it, you know, something like 10 or 20 times more expensive once it's released than, than you know, finding it in your unit test. So a lot of times defects are a result of confusion. Um, so there's some examples below of categories where it's it's more about confusion than it is uh, bad practice, right? So it's not about developers doing, you know, just being uh, lazy or uh, careless as much as they don't always know what they're supposed to build. They might think they know what they're supposed to build, but it, they actually interpret the requirements wrong. Uh, there's also this concept of reopens, which is really when QA doesn't know what to test. It's the same actual problem in a slightly different uh, slightly different way. Now, reopens cause a lot of churn, 
uh, you know, you have to go back to the developer and then the developer has, you ultimately have to go back to the product owner or the product manager and everyone has to clarify is QA correct or is development correct? And like, what's the real story here? And so that's a really good example reopens of a, a quick place you can trim waste, right? If you can be more clear in the requirements, this doesn't mean writing down more. Maybe it's just a matter of, you know, doing a proper grooming session. Like if you're sk skipping grooming or not everyone's attending grooming, you know, maybe just getting everyone actually together to talk about requirements and agree upon what the acceptance criteria is, uh, is enough to eliminate this category. Uh, again, in modern, modern agile, this is not as much of an issue, but it's still certainly out there and you should look for it. And part of what I was talking about updating tickets is it's good to do a review of the defects tickets and actually categorize them in, in whatever way makes sense, you know, whether it's escape defect, a design flaw, requirement flaw, um, you know, a coding mistake, uh, reopen. I mean, there's lots of different categories you can choose from, but understanding the, diff the different categories will allow you to focus your energy and, you know, find the things that are wasting the most time. But typically, it comes around requirements. Okay. Hey, Mike, there's a question here. Yeah, great. Yeah. Uh, so it is about the defects. What percentage you find reasonable for defects going out in a release? What percentage of escape defects um, yeah. is acceptable? That's a really interesting answer. Uh, and later in this uh, topic, I, I talk uh, I talk about this, but from a different angle. So I think this is a good time to address this. Um, ideally, an escape defect. The way I look at escape defects, if it requires you to do an emergency patch, then it's never acceptable. So if you have to take time out of your normal schedule to go back and fix this defect. Uh, in terms of doing a patch, and in the worst, it's doing a patch like an emergency the next day or like overnight, um, then that's not an acceptable defect. If it's an escape defect that the customer can live with, maybe it's painful, uh, but they can live with it. There's a good workaround and there's a, and you know, it may only take, you know, two weeks or th they can live with it for two weeks or four weeks or whatever your normal plan maintenance schedule is, depending on the size of the product. Uh, then those are, I would say somewhat acceptable, right? You'd obviously want to reduce those to a minimum, but um, I don't think I could put a percentage on it, uh, but certainly I would categorize it by how impactful it is. If it's extremely impactful and particularly impactful to the business, meaning your team, then I would try to eliminate those at all costs. So moving on just to show this in a very primitive picture, um, what I'm talking about is at the when we, first started with this team, you know, there's a certain amount of features that were expected and, you know, there's obviously going to be defects found in part of that process and there's going to be uh, escape defects that from previous releases that need to be fixed and that's your plan. And then, you know, your plan's too, too optimistic and you end up missing the date. That's what this first section is uh, indicating. So, the execution step that I mentioned is let's just reduce the number of features. So you'll see features are reduced, but the defects and escape defects, you know, essentially coming in the release and from previous releases is the same amount. So we're just reducing the amount of features, assuming that we're going to have the same level of quality so that we can make the timeline. So that's what the execution is about. And maybe you want to do that for one or two cycles um, to get that confidence. And then in the next cycle, you'll wanna start removing defect categories. And once you start removing the amount of defects that actually escape and removing the amount of defects that you're creating and be, you know caught during the cycle, you'll find that your time expands and you'll actually be able to get, like I said, maybe 120% of what you were doing before. And so that's what this graph is trying to show is first, you know, capture in the time window that you expect and then optimize within that window focusing on quality first. And you'll you'll get throughput back. Uh, this has happened over and over again for me. Um, I think I've done this seven or eight times. Uh, and every time this, this particular sequence has worked for me, the first couple of times it was by accident. I didn't really realize that this is the framework that I was using, but later it was a purposeful uh, choice to do this. 
So the final, the final thing is, I think it's really important to have a continuous improvement mindset. Uh, I went to a, a conference last year. I can't remember which one it was. I think it was uh, early of 2019. And someone said, you know, if you're only going to do one thing in Agile, do retrospectives. And I don't remember who it was, so I can't credit the actual speaker that gave, gave that uh, pearl of wisdom. But he's right. This is, this is the thing to focus on. Uh, in fact, I've done a couple of uh, new projects where I really started with a rudimentary pro uh, process and a retrospective, and I let everything fall into place through the retrospective. We would do a retrospective every two weeks, we'd tweak the process, and ultimately what we came up with was something like Scrum, uh, even though we didn't start there. So the other thing about continuous improvement is you really get people believing that continuous improvement reduces waste allows you to do more and provide more value to the business, the, this will happen without you having to get involved. People will come to you on your team and say, hey, you know, we do this thing or we build this tool, I can save, you know, this many hours. And because their mind is thinking in that way, that's, you know, they're, it's a constant thing. Uh, developers like to solve problems. This is a problem that they can solve. So they put their mind to it and, uh, you know, and I'll th throw in QA because most QA now are also developers. I mean, there's not much difference now between developers and QA. So they're problem solvers by nature. So uh, have them also focus on this problem, build the technical uh, capabilities that are needed, but also let's make sure the tooling is in place. Um, one of the other things that I think is important is metrics. Uh, I'm very much a metrics guy. Um, I know metrics are boring. I recently did. Uh, there's a group that I have here in Austin where we meet we're tech executives, and I hosted a session on metrics, and it was one of the least attended sessions of the year, unfortunately, um, because metrics, although important and everyone knows it, it's hard. It's hard to track the data. It's hard to figure out how to report on the data. And then ultimately it's hard to figure out how to use that data. So uh, I think it's really important to do that. And so I really focus on it. So while everyone else is trying to figure out how to get more throughput and increase customer satisfaction, I'm trying to figure out how to measure that so that we can, we can know that our improvement efforts are actually bearing fruit. So early on, I talk a lot about uh, defect reduction so and pl and planning so that you can execute properly so I really start to focus on defect introduction rates the cost of fixed defects you know like how long does it take us to fix a defect and how much time are we spending on defect fixing because uh, these are indicators that we're going you know that we can go in the right direction so if we track this and we track it release over release sprint over sprint we can see that we're trending in a positive way and that our efforts are helping Every once in a while, you have a process improvement idea that doesn't help, and you know this will also uh, this will also tease that out. So, for instance, maybe you change technologies, and people weren't as familiar as they thought they were going to be, or they're not as well trained, and so all of a sudden, a new class of defects start appearing that didn't appear before. So, you know that technology change actually could set you off in the wrong direction in the short term. So, understanding that defects have increased. Figuring out why and then addressing that is really quite important. So we talked about planning techniques. Uh, you know, these are some some techniques I use. Uh, take it or leave it. <laughs> but the first thing is don't fill the plan with things that have to be built. What I try to do is, like I say, commit to maybe fifty or sixty percent with things that absolutely must be built for the business and then put the rest in some kind of bonus feature or stretch goal type of situation. Now, you'll get some pushback from your from your management and peers that, you know, well, if we only have bonus features then people won't work hard to finish the bonus features, but that's not really how people work in development. They wanna complete as much as possible. They wanna use their time wisely. The goal here is to make it so that the business doesn't have to reset if you fail to meet the full plan. Right, so if you're at 60% and you get all 60%, but you don't get 70% or 80% how you might have planned before, 
then there's no resetting to do. You know, tra downstream training, uh, implementation teams, whoever you might have in your that's affected by the release, uh, essentially gets what they expected. And that's really important. Also, be realistic about quality. Don't assume that quality is going to get better until you know that you've done things to make it better. So plan for poor quality that that you have initially. Uh, measure it. Figure out how much it's costing you. We talked about that in the last slide, and then you know put that into your planning. Make sure that there's adequate time to fix all the defects you know are going to come up. Here's one that really frustrates me: is there's a tendency of people to take risky items and push them to the end. But the reality is the riskier items are the ones that are most likely to go wrong. And if they go wrong at the end, you have no time to, to correct for it. So push that risky item to the front, deal with the fact that it might go wrong early and that your throughput early on might be lower, but know that you're not gonna be burned by that type of uh, problem later by having you know easy items, you know simple UI items or whatever might be less risky towards the end of the, the queue. And then one of the things that I find in hidden teams quite often is there's hidden work items. There's things people are doing that aren't documented in the ticketing system. You know, they're not, they don't have a story, they're not a research ticket, they're not tracked. And uh, what, how this manifests is you ask someone, well, you know, you said you were going to get this done in a couple of days and it's taken you five days. What happened? And they're like, well, you know, I had to deal with the support ticket and this other thing. And, you know, someone, I'm training this other guy on this technology and none of that was tracked. And so uh, be very wary of those hidden work items, especially when you're new to the team. As you get more experience, you might find out what's going on there and adjust philosophies according, accordingly or do whatever techniques uh, are available to you. But what I like to do is just make every, every work item transparent. I put them in as tickets, uh, engineering tickets, like if you're using JIRA, there's the blue tickets versus the green tickets. Uh, I just make blue tickets and actually track that as if they were a story. All right, so as far as testing focus, um, two things here, set goals and focus your automation efforts. And in the setting goals, we talked about earlier, like let's let's just eliminate the need for emergency patching. Uh, that's a huge that's a huge distraction for the team, and it's very painful for the business to have to do an emergency patch. You know, worst case during the middle of the day, like that certainly happened to me, where everything is shut down, people can't even log in uh, during the middle of the day, and you have to figure out how to fix that under a time crunch. And it it's definitely hurts morale, and it definitely hurts the business. So, make a policy to uh, to eliminate those things. And part of this, the second point is, you know, figure out what those things are and actually test rigorously on those. Maybe let some other regression slide if you don't have enough time, but really make sure the things that have to work actually work when you release. Uh, it's helpful to have, you know, a post-release uh, stress test, like you can go in and make sure that these key things are working before the customers hit it, uh, you know, whatever it takes, but really eliminate this uh, out of band work. And then as far as focusing your automation efforts, what I would say is don't try to boil the ocean with automation. Don't say, well, we're gonna automate every endpoint or you know every page or whatever. Just again, focus on these things that really matter to your customers and start there. And over time, yes, you'll build it out to a complete system, but if you can eliminate the things that really bother your customers, then they'll wait for these other things to be fixed. And then finally, um, I mentioned earlier, like a good waterfall process is better than a bad agile process. Uh, I do want to uh, confirm with everyone that I am a big proponent of agility and agile processes. And here are some of the key things that I think are important in, in agile, you know, establishing a cadence, delivering early, uh, especially, you know, even to your internal customers, but even better to external stakeholders. Um, have the team buy into the schedule uh, so that they don't feel like they're just being stuffed with work. And again, the definition of done, I, I can't stress enough how important that is. And then finally, even more important than definition of done is retrospectives. 
even if you have long release cycles, you should do frequent retrospectives. Uh, it's amazing what insight you learn, but also it's a good teaming and uh, morale building activity. When people start realizing they're all sharing the same, you know, the same problems and they're all in it together, uh, I think you get better solutions at the end of the day. It might, I just can... have one more slide. Rohit, any questions? Yes, I think we can take one one, one more question here. Uh, so any recommend, recommendations on how to get the team buy-in into the schedule? Yeah, that's a good question. So I think I think the general theory here is, you know, a bottom-up approach. So you allow the team to analyze what's needed and and you know, sort of, sort of get to vote on what the schedule is in a sense um, by by measuring the pieces. Now that's tricky when you do release planning on a sprint by sprint basis. I think that methodology works really well, but when you do release planning where it's going to be multiple sprints, you know, a longer time, let's say it's a three month period, it's much harder to get in front of that, right? To have the team distracted by looking at all the requirements and doing detailed estimates. So what I try to do is uh, I do something which I call pattern matching, which I think has a different name in modern agile te uh, techniques, which I, it's slipping my mind right now. But essentially what it is, is, you know, this thing that we have to build coming up, does it look like any of these 10 or 20 things we built in the past? And what, what I would do is I'd go into a meeting and I'd write down those features. Like, uh, you know, I'm not talking about a story, but maybe a group of stories. I say, does, does this new thing that we're trying to build look like any of these? And then, you know, people would vote on that and they would sort of agree like, oh, it looks more, most like this, you know, thing that had a lot of back end work. And, and then what I do is, and then I show them the number for that thing. Like that means, you know, that was, you know, say 50 story points or whatever, whatever measurement you're using, 50 days of work. And then uh, use that as sort of the baseline for this long-term planning, because then you're going to, you can do this planning in like an hour instead of, you know, maybe days of looking through requirements and asking lots of questions with the product manager, et cetera. That still has to happen. Don't get me wrong. But, you know, early on when you're doing long range planning, you don't want to spend a lot of time doing that versus the actual work that needs to be done for the current release. So hopefully that helps answer your question, Rohit, there. That's definitely a good, good insight of how we can get team buy-in. Yeah. Okay, like I said, there's just one last slide uh, takeaways here. Uh, again, broken teams doesn't imply bad people. Uh, it's almost all never the case. Uh, sometimes there's some bad eggs, you know, people that, you know, are, uh, you know, they're not buying into the new culture or whatever, and you have to deal with that. But mostly everyone wants to do a good job and they just need someone to lead them in the right direction. Establishing the right culture, that's what this is all about. Uh, getting people to think through, you know, getting people to believe in execution and quality as important aspects of their job uh, is critical. And then ultimately, you know, that that establishing that continuous improvement mindset in the end. And then finally, you know, agile methods are not strictly required here. In fact, if you're not very agile now, uh, you can still get there. And you can do it incrementally through this retrospective process and applying the techniques I mentioned in this uh, in this presentation. And with that, Rohit, that's it. Um, hopefully, uh, those of you who joined enjoyed the presentation. Um, like I say, this is a relatively new presentation for me, so I haven't given it too many times. I uh, apologize for any awkwardness there. Uh, feel free to uh, reach out to me on LinkedIn. I always like talking about this stuff. Uh, I can give you more examples, things that I've run across and ways that I've solved them. Yeah. And thanks for joining. Uh, so Rohit, I know you have a few slides and I'd love to take some more questions. Yeah, sure, Mike. Again, thanks again, Mike. Uh, so I encourage everyone to enter their question in the chat box. While questions are coming in, I'll quickly give an overview of Synergy. Uh, so Synergy is a software services company. Our target market is small to mid-size. We help our clients in accelerating their engineering or product roadmap, and we give them 
around 50% cost advantage. Right, so this is just a snapshot of some of our clients, current and past clients. Over the past 16 years, Synergy has partnered with over around 150 companies. Our clients are 100% referenceable. Check out our testimonials on our website. Right, so this is an upcoming webinar, going serverless with AWS. This is going to be on Tuesday, October 20th at 1 p.m. Central Time. The SMEs for this uh, webinar would be Alchemy and AWS, and the host will be uh, the presenter of today's uh, this thing webinar, Mike Watson. And yeah, I think that's going to be. Uh, if I if you don't mind me talking about that real quick, uh, I think that's going to be a really interesting session. So we're having uh, our customer Alchemy along with AWS chat about uh, how to go serverless, some of the pitfalls, and how they've overcome them. Yeah, yeah, sounds good. Yeah, right. Right. So hey, here is our contact information. Feel free to contact us for any questions. And now it is time to let's go over to some questions from the audience. So let me just take a look. So yeah, so there's one question about the leadership. Uh, and it is my uh, attitude reflects re leadership. If C-suite, my leaders can't commit, how do I get them on board? That's an interesting question. So um, let me make sure I understand the question. So if if your peers aren't willing to commit or the leaders that are working yeah. under you? So the question is, uh, if the C-suite, the leadership, they oh, can't. Yeah, so I missed the C-suite part. Um, yeah, so that's, that's the number one question I get after giving this presentation, actually. Um, and it's, it's really challenging because you have to you have to really be able to sell that things are going to get better, that there's going to be a short period of things are worse in terms of throughput and customer value, but ultimately it's going to be much better. You're going to have higher customer satisfaction and you're going to have more throughput as a result of taking some short-term pain. I think however you can sell that, uh, it's really important to make that happen. I've, I've had success in every case but like i said sometimes it's taken a lot of effort to get there and you know i put my personal reputation on the line to make it happen i think laying out something like what i've laid out here is helpful so you can show the vision like how it's going to happen i mean hopefully when you've seen it uh here presented you see how logically it can work um but but yeah getting leadership to buy in is is probably the toughest part. But uh, one of the things that I say to the leadership team ultimately, like when it comes down to this, is you hired me to fix this. Let me fix it. So that that's what I ultimately find works the best. Yeah, makes sense. Um, there's another question. Uh, how do you recommend handling high priority product requirements that come up during a plan sprint, which is exactly right? Yeah, okay. Just making sure I understand. So yeah, this this is inevitable. Um, so there's, I have two thoughts on this. One is you have to have a process that can accommodate that. Um, this is part of the committing to less um, theory. Uh, if you're releasing sprint by sprint out to the wild, uh, that's amazing, right? If you have a broken team and you're releasing sprint by sprint, that uh, uh, you're probably not as broken as you think. Uh, but if you talk about release windows, you know, let's say it's a month long release or six weeks. What I, the first thing that I try to do is figure out if it really has to be done, right? So is this really worth interrupting all the other things that we have to do and really, you know, pressing back, pushing back on usually product management. Sometimes it's executive management asking you to do this and really qualify that if it really is necessary then uh, you know you have to figure out how to get it in um you have to it, but it's a zero-sum game so you have to trade off something so that's the other thing as part of this conversation is you know is it more important than these four other things that we also have to do in this room and and really try and figure that out because when you start making it a shared problem like it's not me just saying no or me 
complaining that, you know, oh, it's a distraction and the team's, you know, going to be impacted, but actually saying, here's the real thing that's happening. Like we have these five, four things, it's turned into five things. We only have so much capacity. We have to finish, you know, by a certain date. What do we trade off? Like, help me make those decisions. Uh, that, that works pretty well, actually. Uh, so yeah. I suggest taking that route. Yeah. Right. Another question, and then it is related to Mike, what you talked about when you're talking about the agile practices and ret retrospectives. Uh, so question is teams that do not strictly follow agile practices. What type of retros retrospectives do you recommend? Yeah, so I would do, you know, a formal retrospective per, you know, normal agile practice. Uh, the key, though, is to do it often. So I like to, regardless of my release cycle, um, I like to do two week retrospectives. So I think there's a lot to be learned in two weeks, especially early on when there's a lot of problems and a lot of unblocking. You know, we talked about earlier about how the leaders get involved and, you know, what, what can they do to help? Like these retrospectives every couple of weeks really help us understand that as leaders. I don't recommend participating in them, but let the team discuss it out and then give you the results. You know, here are the things that we think are problematic and here's the action items I think will help us succeed. And then, you know, giving them advice on what to do and what order and what your feelings are and how, how much business value is created by those various things. And then, you know, making sure that the team takes action. That's the second thing is don't just do a retrospective and then forget about it. Come up with two or three items that you can fix in the next couple of weeks and focus on fixing them make that part of the priorities yeah so right. i think i think you know the cadence you know having a cadence like a two-week sprint cadence for some of these things like demos i would suggest the same thing for product demos don't wait you know if you have a six-week release cycle don't wait till the fifth week to start demoing anything get stuff done early create some urgency around it and get the product team involved as quickly as possible so you can eliminate you know the the problem that all of us have probably seen where at the end of the cycle things aren't exactly what product management wanted and there's a lot of scrambling and then of course that leads to more bugs and then you scramble and fix those bugs like it's a very vicious cycle so if you can get demos retrospectives you know throughout the cycle and you know get more people looking at the problem sooner the the better you're going to be yeah right and that I, I think we can take one more question uh which is how can we fix the issues in execution of roles? Can we help teams by training? So I think it is probably related to somewhere where you have a scrum master and you have different roles, make sure that these roles are really executing in a way that, it, that they are supposed to. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, and it's really something not talked about in this presentation, but it'll come up as you're going through this and maybe you know maybe in a future version of this presentation i can add it so misalignment of roles is common right so not having a scrum master not having a product owner or someone that can represent the product on a daily basis um these things come up all the time you know too many developers not enough qa um i don't think i've ever seen the opposite <laughs> um so having a misaligned team like having the wrong mix of players uh, is definitely going to cause problems. And one of my you know, top successes, uh, one of the few things that I changed early on is I took a developer who was um, a strong, uh, it was a local developer. We had an offshore team. And I, I took that developer who had an interest in doing requirements and I made them a requirements writer, essentially a product owner. And <clears throat> that alone, uh, eliminated a large number of defects because now instead of having weak requirements coming from a product manager that didn't really have the technical details sorted, uh, we had someone focused on basically converting those you know weaker requirements into strong requirements and um, somewhat without magic. <laughs> the the uptick of work working features, features that actually worked the way they were supposed to and that the customers were able to use them as they released went up immediately. Uh, prior to that, there was a lot of complaints about, you know, yeah, we build a lot of things, but none of them really work. Um, this solved that problem. And it was a simple role change. Switch a developer, 
into a requirements analyst. Okay. And there's one more question is about, is the require, recording of this webinar going to be available later? So I think that is going to be available on our website. And Jill, I think you are sending an email with the link. Yes, it will be ready tomorrow and you'll get an email directly from me around the same time tomorrow with a direct link to the recording. Right. Okay, so with this, uh, we have reached the end of our webinar time. And I would like to thank Mike and audience for joining us today. And if we did not get to your question, please feel, to, feel free to follow up with me directly and then I'll be happy to answer it. All right, Jero, it was my pleasure to talk on the topic, and I want to also thank everyone for joining and listening in, and hope you all have a great day. Yep, thank you. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye.